Okay, so uh, from now I will be speaking only English because here we have uh, uh, famous uh, speaker Chris Zukowski, who is uh, 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 is the marketing strategist, and he specializes on uh, sales on Steam and newsletter. And so I will pass uh, the word to him. And yeah, Chris, it's yours. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Hi, everybody, thanks for having me. Um, this is, uh, my talk here, How to Market a Game on Steam 2021. Strangely enough, we're almost done with 2021, so I'm gonna have to change this talk, but this advice still applies. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna show you a little history of Steam and why this all matters and, and how you're gonna market your game. So this, is, this screenshot here is the original Steam. Uh, back then it was just for launching Valve games, you know, you can see in the bottom left, Counter-Strike, Day of the Beat, that list down there of games, that was entire Steam. You didn't even need a scroll bar. You could just fit all the games just in a little dialogue. Isn't that amazing? But times changed, and in October 2005, uh, this game, Ragdoll Kung Fu, appeared on store. It was the first non-Valve game to appear on Steam. Um, you can actually still buy it. It's still out there. It's, it's only like a dollar, too. Um, but anyway, so from 2005 to 2012, Valve had to personally approve every game on Steam. You you would submit your game to Valve and they would approve it and then let you on, or they would say, no, no going. Valve was essentially like the bouncer of a club. He was grumpy, standing there saying, no, 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 no. There was a lot of no's back in that day. Um, and then they changed it in 2012 to 2017, they started Greenlight. Now Greenlight was, it was almost like kind of like a Kickstarter where you'd post your game on this website and then the community of Steam would vote yes or no whether they wanted that game. And if you got enough upvotes, you were in. Um, Valve and Gabe here, this is a quote from Gabe, decided, you know what? We're not gonna post uh, games on Greenlight anymore. We're changing it. So that ended in 2017. And what replaced it was the new era where any with a hundred dollars could come onto Steam, and it was shovelware time. Um, because you only needed a hundred dollars, everybody put their game on, and that and the Steam store was flooded with stuff. That graph right here is showing all the games that all of a sudden appeared uh, between 2017-2018. So it was a wild one. Weird games showed up, like games that cost two hundred dollars called Strike Mole. Um, a lot of people think they were laundering money with these games. Something illegal was going on with these high-priced, really terrible-looking games. Nobody quite knows. Uh, but that was the wild era of 2017 to 2018. And this is a time when indie said, um, this is the indie apocalypse. Too many games. They're all junk. They're all clogging up the store. And a lot of indie said, we want curation. We want curation. We wish the store was curated. Um, what they basically meant was back in the old day when Valve was there, blocking anybody and they'd have to approve every game that was on Steam. Basically, yeah, that's curation. But that doesn't work very well. Um, and here's what happened. In 2018, Valve did something a little strange. We called it the October event. And this is some numbers from a developer named Jake Burkett. He shared these numbers. And you can see on the 11th of October, all of a sudden his sales fell. Just all, all of a sudden, October 18th was the time period. And we, we developers on Steam were just looking at each other like, what's wrong? Why, why are our sales so bad? And Valve said, you know what? We're testing some things in the back end. We're secretly testing things. And so um, they wrote this long, long blog post. You can see the link down there at the bottom. I don't expect you to type that in. Just, just Google about store traffic and games in October. But basically, they published this blog post that said, we're sorry. We accidentally hurt testing some things. It's going to go back to the way it was. But then in the middle of the paragraph, they hit this one little line that's the most thing Valve has said about games in a long time for us developers. And everybody passed over it, but not me. I'm going to watch out for you all. Here's what it said. We still kept a part of the change that factored in sales and wishlist popularity. What they're saying here is secretly, yeah, anybody can post their games on Steam, but we're going to look to see how much money you're making and how many wishlists you're getting. Basically, they hid the algorithm change in that paragraph. And the result was this. So about a year after that mysterious blog post, that mysterious event, we were like, what happened? What, what, what happened to all our traffic? 
Valve started testing and they said one year after that October event, um, look at the sales difference. If your game, what this graph does, this graph is showing the year 2018. So if you released a game in 2018 compared to a game released in 2019, what was the difference in earnings? And what Valve was saying here in this graph, which they wrote this long blog post, again, the link to a new blog post is down there at the bottom. Valve was saying, if you released a game in 2019, look at how much more money you made because you released it under our new algorithm changes versus our old one. Look at all this green. So if you're in the 90th percentile all the way down to the 40th percentile, you made more money if you released your game on 2019 than you did 2018 because of these algorithm changes. Steam was saying, look at how much more visibility we we're giving you. Look at all this money. Now, I'm a curious, curious person, and I'm saying, well, what about this over here? This means you releasing a game in 2019 made less money if you're at the bottom third of the pile. If you are making zero dollars to about the 30th percentile steam between 19 and 18 you made less money a lot less look at all this red so what does this mean secretly the steam valve guy that's you know saying yes or no is laying in the data he's hiding in there and he's keeping games from going into the green area okay that is the secret algorithm curation right there so I'm going to teach you all how to get past the secret curation guy. We're going to look at him. This is me standing there. Um, I'm a marketing strategist. I look at indie games. People hire me to uh, look at their portfolio, mostly publishers. I really help publishers a lot. And we just kind of look at how to improve game marketing so that you can sell your game and get past that guy that's, oh, don't get past. We're gonna get you through that. So I write a week blog on howtomarketagame.com right there. And then that's my Twitter handle, at Adventure Mountain, okay? I also made this free class. There's a free class here called How to Make a Steam Page. It's totally free. I will teach you how to make a Steam Page. Okay, so um, I got a lot of this information. I, I kind of picked all this up because <clears throat> I run these studies. I do weird research projects. Um, I, I did one for GDC called Empathizing with Steam. Basically what I did was I watched people shop on Steam for uh, several months. Just random people shopping on Steam, see what they liked, what they didn't like, what they clicked on. It was to kind of understand how Steam looks in the eyes of the average gamer, not us crazy developers, just normal, normal developers. Um, I also learned a lot of this just because I'm, I'm my own games. I released a game called One Screen Platformer. It's a platformer game on Steam. So that's kind of where I learned a lot of just how Steam works. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about is how to get past this guy, how to get him to undo the rope and say, welcome to the wonderful world of Steam money. So we're going to talk about the four ways to sneak past him. Game and genre, wish lists, and then how to get boring daily growth, which I love. I love boring stuff. So how to get boring daily growth, and then how to get those really exciting promotions where the numbers shoot up in the air and everything's good, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So first off, let's start with game and genre. Game and genre are so important. Uh, what I hear a lot from developers are, oh, if you just make a good game, you'll get on there. And that's actually pretty true. But it's gotta be a good game that everybody wants and is good looking. It's true, I wish it weren't, but that's what it is. It can't just be a good game. It has to meet these kind of things. People have to want it. There's gotta be kind of the thing of desire and Steam has very specific tastes. The, the players who are on Steam shopping games like certain type of games and they really don't like other types. So that's why I'm saying genre is one of the most important aspects of making a successful game. What genres are selling and what are not. I cannot emphasize enough. Genre is very important. Let me show you. I look at Steam, there's these things called Steam tags and you can count up how many tags there are on Steam for every game, and then see how many there are, okay? So if we look at puzzle and platformer, there are lots of games tagged with puzzle and platformer, lots of them. Now, if you look at something like City Builder, there aren't many games tagged City Builder. There's just a lot more City Builders out there, or a lot more puzzles and platformer games. But if I graph the estimated earnings, and you can do this using some 
by looking at the reviews, that's how you kind of figure out how many how much money they earned. You see this inverse. The games that are so that there are a ton of like puzzle and platformers, there aren't they don't make much money. But the games like City Builders, building games, 4X, which are like strategy games, they make a lot of money. So the there's kind of this inverse. Of, a lot of people make puzzle platformers, but they don't sell very much. It really matters what genre you have. Now, you might be saying, well, I'm making a pixel art platformer. I'm just going to tweet extra hard. I'm going to do some extra marketing. I'm a very hardworking person. I'm going to do it. And I, I appreciate you for being a hardworking person. But let me tell you why, no matter how hard you try, it might not just happen. And, and let, me tell, let me give you an example here. Okay. This is actually where I live. This is the United States. It's way down in Mexico. We're in the deserts of America. I, I, I live in Tucson, Arizona, home of the Grand Canyon. Um, this is my childhood home. This is where I grew up. Now, you might notice, you see the cactus right up front. I really did grow up in the desert. Like if you watch the old Bugs Bunny cartoons, anytime they wanted to show Bugs Bunny in the desert, they put those cactuses, the saguaro cactus. I literally grew up in the place where they have saguaro cactuses. I live in the desert. Now, you might come to me and say, Chris, I've got an idea. I'm an indie ski maker. I make skis for people. What if I brought skis to Tucson? People in Tucson, they need skis. And I looked around Tucson. I actually looked on Google. I called some people and I found there is one place that sells skis in all of it, Tucson. And I called them up and they said, we don't sell snow skis. We sell jet skis. They go in the water. We, we sell jet skis. No, no, nobody wants skis here. And so you could come to me and say, Chris, but I still want to do my indie ski shop. And we're going to tweet the coolest ski memes. We're going to hire a guy who can make the most artisanal skis, handmade, handcrafted skis, hire ski influencers. But guess what? It doesn't matter. No matter what you do, nobody buys skis in Tucson. We just don't ski here. So it's just like that on Steam. There just aren't people buying puzzle platformers, 2D platformers. There's just not the market. It's like selling skis in Tucson. If nobody wants it, no matter how good your marketing is, nobody will buy your game. It doesn't matter. You can't convince Tucsonans to ski. You can't tell Steam to buy puzzle platforms. They just don't want them. The type of game that you make is the most important marketing decision you will make. It's more than more important than anything I will tell you today. I could just stop the performance right here. Just shut down. I won't because I told him I'd talk for like an hour. Uh, but this is this is the most important advice that you pick and make, okay? Um, all my research comes off of this website. Um, it's a really good resource, gamestats.com, Steam tags. You can look at all the games. They estimate how much each game makes. It's a, it's a rough ballpark, but it's a good website to kind of validate how, how possible it is to make money off of your games. And what you can do is you can sort by the tags, which ones are the most important, which ones aren't. And you can see off to the side, the median earnings. And if you look at something that's very popular right now, which are like, colony sims you'll see the median one the one that the median half make more half make less is forty four thousand dollars for a colony sim but for a puzzle platformer or just a platformer in general the median is 1200 see it doesn't matter what you do marketing wise it's just people on steam want colony sims so much more than they want platformers it's just the way it is so what kind of games do steam like Yes, those genres like builders, strategies, but they want dark settings. They kind of like dark dungeons, medieval, cyberpunk, dystopias. They're kind of, a, they're kind of dark on Steam. Um, they like deep gameplay, very strategic games that they can tinker, very complex systems, crafting, card battlers. They really like those. They also like endless content, like they could replay the game over and over with a new strategy or a new way of approaching things. They could play with this thing. That's the type of game that the Steam audience really likes, okay? Now, I'm not saying cancel every game that you're working on just to make those types. I'm trying to show you this so you can calculate the odds. So you can say, we're thinking of making this game. Should we make this game for three years or should we just try and get this game out right away and just do it in a year and see what happens? Because if you learn the odds, you can see your chances of earning the game and that'll help you determine, should we add more money to this or just cut our losses and sell it? Okay? If you're making art games, you're making games just for the fun of it, God love you. Do it. Don't worry about the numbers. If you don't 
profit, you just care about the lives that you touch and the dreams that you inspire, go for it. I, I won't stop you. Um, that's okay. But um, I'm talking mainly to people who want to, you know, earn money, earn a return on their investment, that sort of thing. That's, that's who I'm going for. So that's okay. So now you got the right genre. Let's just say, all right, I'm making a colony sim. I'm going to make it and drop it with no marketing. I'm going to pull a Beyonce and just release an album out of nowhere. Okay. Genre is important, but it's not that important. You still got to do some marketing. So I'm going to show you in the next section here how to actually market your game, even if you're going to make the most popular genre on Steam, which is like 4X, that you can make a lot of money in making a 4X strategy game. Let's talk about something called wish lists. All right. All right. So a lot of indies think, I don't have to do marketing. We're just going to launch it. And our game's so amazing. We're going to go viral. Viral. Um, here's the thing. You know how I talked about this guy, this invisible guy who's hiding in the numbers, hiding in the algorithm, preventing you from just going viral. He, he kind of secretly gatekeeps people from earning this lower third to the top third. If you get past this guy, Steam really shows your game around and gets you a lot of money. Well, he's the, the going viral police. It's really hard to get. The way you kind of get past him is adding a wish list. Now, Steam runs on these things called wish lists, where if somebody likes your game, if a regular shopper likes your game, they click this button called add to wish list, and then you get a wish list. And then what happens is when your game goes on sale or it launches, um, they will get an email from Steam that says, hey, a game you've wishlisted is on sale or it's now available for purchase. Um, this thing right here, this email, is the most powerful thing in marketing, uh, marketing games. You will see this and a high conversion will happen where people will click that and buy the game. It just works very, very well. Not influencers, not Twitter. Nothing works as well as this email that Steam sends out. So you want your game to have be sent out on those emails, right? You do that with wish lists. So basically, when your game launches, four to twenty percent of your wish lists will convert into sales. That's general depends on how quality your game is, how many, how good your reviews are. But just kind of ballpark it: four to twenty percent of your wish list will convert to sales within the first month. Okay. So secretly, and there's debate. It's it's a rough number. I'm not saying it's an exactly you do this. 10,000 is kind of, it kind of is the range where I say, okay, if you get 10,000 wish lists for your game, Steam starts kind of paying attention to you. It's not, the algorithm does some certain things to do that. They'll help you out a little bit, just a little bit. It's not saying you will be a success or won't. It just means Steam starts to pay attention to you a little bit once you get around 10,000. Sometimes seven, sometimes 12, but I'd say for safety, 10,000 wish lists. That's how many you have to get, okay? But the problem is getting 10,000 wish lists, tricky. So let's talk about it. Okay. The reason I say 10,000, it's not a hard number. It's not like Steam's algorithm looks at it and says, if greater than 10,000, the bouncer goes away, the secret guy goes away and you earn money. That's not how the algorithm works. Basically, I'm just saying that the algorithm's kind of set up to start paying attention to you. And here's one example of this algorithm paying attention to you. It ranks all the games about a week before launch, there's this widget called Popular Upcoming. So a week before your launch, if you're in the top section of games that are releasing in the next week, you'll appear on this little sectional chart here called Popular Upcoming. There's a little tab and it's there. This is a very high visibility area. Steam shoppers really do look at this. If your game appears on here, you'll earn about 1,000 to 3,000 wish lists per day. Steam shoppers really pay attention attention this thing, but they'll only let you be on here if you get a lot of wish lists. And that's why I say there's no set number, but if you're at about 10,000, maybe a little bit less, you, you have a really good possibility of appearing on this list. It's just a great way to get free visibility. And it's again, it's Steam going, all right, I'm gonna test you out just a little bit. And this is one of those first places where they're like, you know what, you look okay. Why don't you come in just a little bit, not all the way in, but you can just at least stand in the closed doorstep. That's what, what's happening here. That's the Steam algorithm kind of working for you, okay? Now, if you're like, okay, I know I need to get 10,000, I'll just get a viral um, you know, streamer to play me. Well, guess what? Even a top tier streamer cannot get you 10,000 wish lists in a day, okay? A Steam wish list campaign to launch your game takes a while. It takes several streamers to get up to that minimum of 10,000. It takes a lot. But I actually like that because 
it gives you time to kind of try some things, figure out your messaging, figure out what works. You don't have to try and line everything up in the last week. You have time to kind of build this over time. It takes a lot of shots on goal, so you have more chances to fail and succeed. So let's show you what this looks like. This is what a good, well-marketed game looks like. Now, this is a graph over time of a game with um, gathering wish lists. Now, you'll see this chart is called followers. Um, in the Steam world, we publicly, we can only see followers, but there's a very strong correlation between wish lists and followers. It's about 10 wish lists equals one follower. So you see how this game at this moment on May 7th, 17th, 2020 has 896 followers. Roughly, that means 8,960 wish lists. That's just the kind of math you can do, okay? Now, as you can see, their followers grow over time. It's not just like, boop, boop. No, it's a very gradual increase over time. This is what a good Steam campaign looks like. It's over months and months, not just like in the last month, not in the last week. You have to build it over time. It's a long, slow process to build your wish list. Now, a good wish list campaign has two parts. The exciting spikes, and you can see in that first part where I underline it, you'll see that giant spike. Sometimes it comes in and, and quick spikes, and then other times it's just a slow increase where you're not doing much promotion and your game just kind of naturally tugs along, slowly increasing over time, okay? There's two parts. I'm gonna cover both of them here. The, what I call the boring daily growth, which is that slow boop, 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 boop. And then the exciting promotions, which are those spikes up, okay? We're gonna cover both of them today. So let's talk the boring daily growth, which is actually my favorite because I like boring stuff and I'm gonna hopefully teach you how to like boring stuff too. So let's talk about it. Okay, every, every game shows your game somewhere. Someplace on Steam that Steam is exposing your game. You just have to be ready for the people when they expose your game. Now, it's called an impression when Steam shows your game and it's this little box called a capsule. It's just your cover art. Steam calls it a capsule. I don't know why they call it that. I don't know why they don't just call it your game's title page. But it's basically just a little image you can upload to Steam and say, here's my, this represents my game. Now, an impression means Steam showed it to somebody. Like a long list of games, boom, your name, your game's name is in there. That's an impression. So let's look at two games. This is real data from real games. There were two games, Omen X, Toe Plague, Lo-Fi Ping Pong. Both games got right around 30,000 impressions per week. This is over seven days, okay? Visits mean if they like your capsule, they click the capsule and then they go to your Steam page. That's called a visit. Now, as you can see, Lo-Fi Ping Pong got 9.6% of people who saw that icon clicked it, whereas Omen Exito, only about 6%, 6.7% saw it and then clicked it and went to visit the Steam page. So as you can see, a little bit of a difference. And then if they like what they saw on the Steam page, I told you the Steam shoppers like to hit wish list. Um, uh, Lo-Fi Ping Pong got 161 wish lists and Omen X to Toe uh, got 59. This is over a seven day period, not doing any major promotion. Just the, the developers were doing other things. The Steam page was just doing its own thing. That's what it looks like. Now, you might look at these percentages and say, oh, the difference is 9.6 versus 6.7 to 4.7 versus 2.7. Not, that's a percent here, percent there. What's the deal? Well, if you extrapolate this and just expect this type of traffic for a whole year, remember this is over seven days. So if we just extrapolate this over a whole year. Look what happens. Lo-Fi Ping Pong would get 8,372 over a year, whereas Omen Exito would get 3,068. A big difference. Nothing beats compound interest, folks, right? So it's the same thing. If you've got a little bit better of a percentage increase over time, that adds up a lot. So there are some things that you can do to improve your Steam page to kind of up those percentages here and there, okay? One of them is to improve your graphics. This is an example of a game that had their capsule image. It was just a screenshot of the game and a kind of cheesy text called Dwarven Valley. They posted that, that was their capsule. Not a lot of people clicked it. They went and they got a highly illustrated, good looking character for Dwarven Valley. Look at that, look at how good that character looks. And look at the chart increase. You can see the date that they whopped out that capsule image. It's a huge increase. That's just by improving your graphics. I, I'm telling you, money-wise, the best spending you can do is in improving your capsule because your capsule will be shown more places, more times than any other, more than your trailer, more than your screenshots. Your capsule is the most important investment on your marketing dollar.
okay? Now, let's look at this. You wanna hint at your genre. You don't wanna just, uh, just put up any capsule. Theme shoppers are savvy. They kind of know the genres they like and they don't. So if your capsule kind of evokes the, the genre that your game is, you can attract the right audience. And in this case, builder games, crafting games, for some reason, they always have a hammer in there. Look at that. Shop Titans has a hammer. Crafting Idol Clicker, they have two hammers. They're so excited about being a crafting game, they put two hammers in their capsule. Guess what Dwarven Valley did when they increased their numbers? Got put in a hammer. So if you're making a craft, look at adding a hammer. Now, every genre on Steam has these little, I don't know, they're just like little secret things. I don't know why. I don't know who decided it. Nobody, I don't think, did. They just figured out everybody's doing this. Let's do this thing. So figure out what the little tropes are in your genre, make sure you add them to your capsule. Every every genre has them, just gotta figure them out. Okay, tagging is very important. So, um, like I said, Steam shoppers have a preference. Some like this genre, some like this genre, some like that genre. Um, it's kind of like flavors and tastes. Some people like Mexican food, some people don't. Um, it's the same thing. Some people like some genres and not. So tagging is very, very important. Um, when I, when I'm, I should clarify is, when you're tagging your game, you want to be as accurate as possible um, because Steam doesn't know what genre your game is. And so when the only way to tell Steam what kind of genre you have, what kind of game, is through tags. And there are sub, sub genres, all tons of them. Um, so you have up to 20 different tags you can apply to your game to tell Steam, I am this very specific type of sub genre so that Steam knows, uh, because Steam knows the play behavior of everybody on Steam, they can show your game to the right audience because they have very detailed data about what person likes what tag the most. What do they play the most? And it's not just like, like, yes, I like this or not. They can see them hours, seconds, minutes played by people. So they can say, oh yes, this person loves puzzle adventure games. So we are gonna show your puzzle adventure game. Now, when you tag your game, you'll see just automatically that Steam does prefer genres. I've, I've looked at these slow building stats for lots of different games. For the higher end genres that Steam players really like, you're gonna see about 50 wish lists a day if you have a city building game, a quality one uh, with good graphics, an action a day, and a puzzle platformer, even a really good one, we're looking at about two wish lists a day. That's just the preferences of Steam shoppers. Now, you might be a puzzle platformer and say, oh, I'm gonna tag my game as a high visibility one city builder. That doesn't work, it's your game. Because if you even if you tag your puzzle platformer as city builder, the fans are gonna look at that game and be like, that's not a city builder, I'm not gonna wishlist this. Steam shoppers are very smart and savvy. They are not gonna be fooled by that. It's all about the game that you're making, okay? So if you have a good Steam page, um, you know, tagged correctly, good art, looking good, you can increase the rate, that slow daily build of wish lists that you don't even have any control over. You know, you just post your Steam page, it just slowly builds. You, you can get very far with that, okay? Now, there's a lot of complications, a lot of tricks to get this right. I made a whole class how to make your Steam page better, totally free. It's a free class. I don't charge anything for it because I think it's so important that you get your Steam page right. So go to how to make a steam page.com. That's my class. I teach you just like I'm teaching you right now, but it's all about steam pages. It's about like how to tweak this or that, how to make your graphics look good, what kind of things work well, what don't, how to do tags. Tags are very important, tricky though. So I show you how to do that in this class. Totally free. How to make a steam page.com. Okay. Section here, exciting promotion. This is the part that everybody asks about. Like, how do I get more wish lists? Um, this is the exciting promotion part. Okay, so when you look at a graph of any game on Steam, this is, by the way, a, a site called steamdb.info, I think. Just Google SteamDB, you'll find it. Um, any game on Steam, you can look up their wish list chart, well, their follower chart, which you can, you know, multiply by 10 to get their, their wish lists. Um, you can look up any game's campaign history, all right? Now, when you look at this, you'll see these little spikes. They kind of look like somebody just chopped a little chunk out of something, but their increased spikes, those are promotional periods when they were like featured somewhere and they got a lot of promotion. Maybe they were covered by a streamer. Maybe they went a viral tweet or something. Maybe they were in a festival. All those sort of things cause these little spikes. I'm gonna show you how to get these spikes, where to get them, how to find them. Okay, 
and I'm going to talk to them in order of importance. So number one is festivals. These are online kind of curated festivals. Some of them are, some of them aren't. And basically what you do is you apply to organizations that are holding festivals. And when you apply, if you get picked, you get um, these festivals will work out with Valve and on, to appear on Steam. So, for example, Games from Quebec organized with Steam and they got a front page featuring for, for about a week where Steam's just and all the games were games from Quebec. They applied and Steam featured them and they got tons of traffic from there. Online, you don't have to go anywhere. A lot of them are virtual only. And these bring in tons of wish lists. Right now, there is nothing better to increase your number of wish lists than festivals. It is worth your time to apply to these, to find these, to locate them. Now, if you go to my website, I have a section where I uh, show you where they are. It's actually on my Discord. On my Discord, we have a channel that tells about upcoming festivals so you can apply to them. These, this is the number one way to get wish lists right now. Number one. Okay. Number two is streamers. Now, uh, they're varying size streamers uh, that you can apply to, but a good streamer, one of the top tier ones, will get you about 1,500 wish lists if you get featured by them and they like your game. And you can do this if you have a good build of your game, like a preview or a demo, you can send it way before your release and just see if they'd play your game. Just send it to them, say, we've got something exciting here, see if they play it. Um, like I said, a good one will get you about 1,500 wish lists per stream. Not all of them will do that. Some of them are like 500, but median, about 1,500. So streamers are also a very good um, way to get those with spikes. Okay, another one is running a beta. So uh, a lot of Steam shoppers really like betas. It's like a free way to help out, play a game that's in progress. Um, if you run a beta, you can reach out to somebody called like Alpha Beta Gamer, promote your beta. It's actually a secret marketing activity. If you do a good beta, well run, uh, you can get about a thousand wish lists for about a week's worth of work of like running a beta, getting people to wish list, reminding them to wish list after the beta, all that kind of stuff. It's a good way to just get visibility. So running a beta is a good way. Reddit posts can earn a lot too, about 1,500 wish lists if you have a good one in a good category. So a good subreddit is our games, our gaming, our indie games. All those are top tier. Ones like our game dev, a kind of a lower wish list count because mostly game devs in there, but still worth posting to our game dev. Um, but your best one is games, gaming. Oh, PC Master Race is another good one. So those, a good post that goes to the front page, 1,500 wish lists for doing one of those. Okay, Viral Imager. Imager is a little harder right now, but uh, Imager is the site where you can upload GIFs, and if people like them, they upvote them. If you get enough upvotes, you end up on the front page of it. If you get on the front page, you get about 400 wish lists. Not too bad, but it's kind of hard nowadays. Press coverage. Um, press coverage is a lot lower. Um, if you get somebody in the press cover, you're talking about 150 wish lists uh, for a good story on one of the top sites like IGN, Kotaku, or PC Gamer. Those are the top sites. If you get there, 150 wish lists. Okay. Social media. Everybody thinks social media mean equals marketing it doesn't work very well. It's kind of low. Uh, unless you have a very, very viral game with very cute animals. For some reason, Twitter and cute animal games do very well. But if you're not making a cute animal game, most of the time your social media posts don't earn that many wish lists. It's very low. Social media just doesn't work that well. I know. That's weird. One exception is TikTok. TikTok's kind of blowing up. I think it's because they're trying to attract users. If you go viral, get millions of views on one of your TikToks, um, we're talking 200 to 1,500 wish lists if you get one of the very viral ones. That's, that's what you're looking at. Okay? So let's just grab some of these numbers. I just pulled these off the shelf. Let's say you're one year out. This is what your year is going to look like. If you have a daily wish list rate of about 15 per day, that's about that, 5,000, 5,500. Uh, wish list there. If you get into three festivals, that's about 2,000. Get two major streamers to cover you, that's about 3,000. You get a viral post, you figure out one that's 1,500. By the end of the year, you got your 10,000. That's kind of the math I like to do. It's very back of the napkin. There's a lot of way, but that kind of shows you what a good campaign is before launch, okay? So that's how you get over that 10,000 hump just to kind of, I'm not saying that's success, I'm not saying Valve will all of a sudden like you, that just gets you visibility, a little bit of extra visibility on Steam when you launch it to get to that 12,000 wish list, okay? That's a much healthier position than just launching your game a week after you put your store page live, okay? So I hope this tells you that you have to work at this. You can't just drop your Steam page out of nowhere, okay? So 
What I've just told you is how to optimize your Steam page, how to get past this guy. He's a little secret guy. He, he blocks games, but if you start playing your cards right, you get a lot of wish lists, you work with your community, you build a community, that's a good way to get past and sell a game, okay? And guess what though? This little invisible gatekeeper, he's actually built into all the sites that I just talked about. Festivals, there's gatekeepers there. Streamers, the streamers are gatekeepers. They decide which games are gonna cover and which ones are not. And Reddit is millions of gatekeepers. A bunch of little guys just looking at a post saying, I like that, I don't like that, I like that, I don't like that. By doing that, they're tiny little gatekeepers. So the gatekeeper is there. The curation is there. It's just been atomized, spread out across the internet. Valve has outsourced all these gatekeepers to all these different sites, and you still have to get past them. It's just they're located in all these different places now, okay? So let me show you an example of a good campaign, Valheim. I'm sure you've heard of that super popular game. I'm gonna show you everything I talked about and how Valheim kind of nailed all those beats, okay? So I'm gonna show you Valheim. It's a Viking game. It's an open world kind of crafting building game. Uh, millions of copies. When it launched, you could see like every week they were earning another million copies. And a lot of people said, oh, this game just went viral. Oh, it just went viral, just went viral. Okay, if you look at their Steam DB chart for followers, you'll see it looks very flat and then a huge spike at the end. So again, you might say, oh, it just went viral, just went viral. Okay, didn't just go viral. I'm gonna show you exactly what happened, okay? So when they launched their game, they had um, 1,600 followers, which translates to 160,000 wish lists. That's a lot of wish lists. They didn't go viral. They had been building these wish lists over time for a very long time. Remember how I said the minimum is like 10,000? They tensed that. They 160 x it. They just did awesome. So let's look at this. How did they get here? Let's look at what kind of game Valheim is. Dark setting. Medieval Vikings armor, ah, oh, dark, brooding. It's got deep gameplay. You know, there's all types of crafting. There's secret things. There's a big world, endless content. You can rerun a character, really build up. It hits all the numbers of what Steam actually kind of likes. Those type. Valheim is the perfect genre for Steam. Okay, was it Twitter? Did they have just some viral Twitter? I think this is cute. This is Valheim's first tweet ever announcing their game. It says, here's some first screenshots of Valheim. Look down there, they had 15 likes, six comments. Nobody paid attention to this game. They, nobody on Twitter said this is an awesome looking game. You can get by without going viral on Twitter. In fact, look at this number. I looked up the total followers when Valheim launched. They launched the game with 1,700 followers. That's not many followers on Twitter. Like I have more than 1,700 followers I couldn't launch a Valheim, I'm not that good. So it has nothing to do with social media. Twitter just had no factor in the success of Valheim. So if you're very stressed about how low your follower count on Twitter is, it doesn't matter. Twitter doesn't matter. You don't need as much social media. You can get by with not social media. They did everything else right, and I'm gonna show you what they did, okay? Slip, blip, and then the, the ramp up starts a little bit higher. I'm gonna show you what happened here, okay? It's, it's microscopic. This one should be logarithmic scale because Valheim's success is so vast, okay? That date is E3 festival, okay? So what happened was they were an E3, PC Gamer featured their announced trailer, and they also announced that they had a new publisher, Coffee Stain. Now Coffee Stain is a very big publisher, also published a very popular game called Satisfactory. It's the perfect audience for Valheim. The people who like games made by Coffee or published by Coffee Stain would also like Valheim. So a lot of stuff all came together right at this moment and it blew up. So a lot of people saw this trailer, a lot of people wishlisted it, did really well. The right publisher will get you very far. In fact, I looked at the, the average increase before they announced with their publisher, they got about, Valheim was earning about 50 wishlists per day. That's before they got a publisher. After they got a publisher, we're talking 120 wishlists per day. That publisher almost tripled their daily wishlist rate. That's just the power of having a good publisher who can really kind of cross promote games, just the matches the audience. That's a good publisher, okay? The other thing that Valheim did that was very good, I talked about betas. They were constantly running betas, slowly building a community. You can see way back in 2018, June 14th, 2018, they did an alpha on itch.io. They also did an alpha beta gamer beta. 
They did lots of open development where people could play the game early, build with it, like it, wishlist it. It was a long, slow campaign, started very small. Look at that, that itch comment down at the bottom. Only 23 upvotes on itch. So um, it's slow building. Way back in 2018, they only had 23 upvotes for their itch game. So it starts, starts slow. Now, one thing I noticed when they launched, they had a huge streamer presence. I don't know if it was paid or not, but as you can see, see how it just spikes about a few days before launch? See how that, this is a graph on SteamDB. Uh, and that red line is the number of streamers streaming the game, as viewers. And you'll notice it's a little bit between the, before the release, about a week. That indicates to me that Coffee Stain and the Valheim folks reached out to streamers and communicated them, organized, and had them streaming before the game launched. And so um, that means there was a dedicated campaign probably paid in the early days, and then it took off from there. So a good streamer campaign just before launch, okay? So after all of that, this is what it takes to launch a good game like a Valheim. Long development period, lots of alphas and betas, getting prime featuring on E3 way in advance, signing with a good publisher, launching with a ton of wish lists. They launched with 160,000 wish lists, not just 1,600, not just 16,000, 160,000. So big pre-launch streamer campaign where the streamers are playing the game and it's a good friendly streamer game where streamers can play for hours and hours, make lots of content. And guess what? Most important, it's just a good game. It's the type of game that Steam likes. It's a quality game. It's a fun game. It has co-op. It is just a good, fun game. You can't beat that. So all of that is the reason Valheim blew up. It's not just like one streamer played it or they went viral on Twitter. It's a long build-up campaign to get there, okay? That's my talk. I'm ready for questions. Send some questions. I will answer them. If you want to get my weekly newsletter and get a free book, um, howtomarketagame.com slash free, and I write this kind of, if you like this talk, I do this every week, like a, a information like this. Every week I send it to your inbox. Howtomakeasteampage.com is my uh, free class on how to make a Steam page, totally free. Um, it's class and I talk just like this. There's my email. If you need some help with your marketing, email me right there. My Twitter handle's at Adventure Mountain. That's how to reach me. Um, I hope I can help you. Send your questions my way. I'll be answering them. Um, so shoot, go for those questions. Otherwise, I'll just, I don't know, maybe I'll sing a song for you all. So let me, I'm checking on my phone because my computer's over there. Send them along. Let's see what kind of questions we have here. Okay. Let's see. I'm looking at on air. Um, <laughs> Yes, I can hear it. Perfect. Uh, it, so it so it's in live stream. Okay, so uh, the first question is: uh, Is it better to start with early access or not? Don't start with early access. Here's here's a, and I wish Steam didn't call it early access. And this is just something. I mean. Valheim is doing early access, but here's a problem that I see a lot happen. People think early access is like soft launching or, oh, I'm just, just kind of putting the game out there, see what it feels like. It is a serious commitment to do early access. You still need to get 10,000 wish lists before you do early access. Um, and early access is like your launch. You need to treat it that way. And here's the problem I see with early access is that a lot of shoppers have been burned by bad early access games. You know, games, maybe they put it out for early access, not enough people bought it, and the developer has said, oh, we're not making money, and I can see a long development period. We're just going to end the game here and close the game. So shoppers are very suspicious of early access games, which means your early access launch is going to be a lot less. Only the brave people with lots of money who are like, I don't care, I'm just going to spend money on this, are going to buy your game, not anybody else. So you're going to see a softer early access launch, and you have to have the right type of game to do in early access. For If you've never made a game before, and this is your first launch, I kind of recommend against doing early access just because you, it's, you have to release your game in a good state, but still early enough that it makes it worth your while. It's really hard to figure out that 
right time to launch an early access game is just too complicated. If you're if you're new to this, never made a game before, I say don't do early access. I it's too it's kind of complicated and you can end up with a game that nobody wants. Okay, and so for example, if if you ha have a game like for example, a survival uh, kind of uh genre, uh is it good to go with early access because I've seen a lot of games uh, doing that. You can. You can do um you can do a survival is actually a pretty good early access type title. Here's the problem that I'm worried about for early access that I, I see as a big risk. Some people think, oh, I can just launch it early, the survival game. But if your game has bugs, like people still expect early access games to be very bug free. Okay. So if it's early and you're like still trying to figure out some of these bugs and you launch with a buggy game, you are going to get mixed ratings. And that just puts you in a hole right off the bat. And then it's very hard to climb out of that. And you have to be willing to keep working on the game, even though sales are low, hoping that eventually when your launch is going to be much better. And that's very hard. You, and you have to have that, that strength to say, we're getting low sales. People think our game is buggy, but we're going to keep releasing. That's the risk that I'm talking about. It's very risky. And if you do it too early, you could really end up hurting your sales going forward. If it works well, it works awesome, but it's very risky in my opinion. Okay, so uh, uh, Yuji from Warhorse says that uh, very nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, and then we have another question. What do you think about relaunching your game as 2021 version, 2022 version, etc.? Uh, EG, if you miss all things, all this planning for your first release. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> it depends on how long you're released. Like if you released a game back in 1998 or something, and you're relaunching it there, awesome. Yeah. Um, you might i've never seen it done like like maybe i don't know when when you first launched your game let's say it was 2018 and you you didn't know that you had to do a long build up for your launch and you just launched it and nobody bought it i mean if it's low enough sure you could do that um you might have some old uh purchases that you know people who purchased it a while ago and then might but if you didn't sell many who cares there aren't that many people anyway try it, it sounds like a good idea i just never have seen it work but um, if you got low enough sales the first time, who cares? Try it again. But I would do some updates, like maybe make the graphics better or add multiplayer or something. I don't know. But yeah, might be worth it. Yeah, okay. Another question. What do you think about the Steam news on the store page? Uh, are they helping with the attention in case uh, the game has followers? Yeah, um, Steam news. You're talking about... Um, like when you push an update and um, then people can see the news is that, I, I assume that's what they're talking yeah, yeah. about. Yes, I think so. Yes. Um, I think it's good. Like I think steam um, uh, steam is actually like the best social network. You know, I said social media doesn't really work. Uh, steam is a social media network. Um, and so if you are posting updates on your steam page and getting a lot of followers, a lot more people are going to see that. So I think it's a great way of doing it. Steam's making it easier. Like patch notes are easier to post. Steam's always adding new events. I really think Steam is getting behind events. What I mean by news events. Um, I always look to see what is Steam developing. That kind of tells me, oh, this is the way Steam wants us to play. They, this is the way they want us to market our games. They're the ones in charge. They're the gatekeepers. So I kind of follow their lead and they keep adding new event features to their news feed and allowing you to post new types of news events. So I say do it. I always try and do the new feature that Steam added because that's what they want. You kind of have to follow Steam's lead. So Valve's lead. So yeah, do them. They're worth it. And you can repurpose that content for your newsletter. Like take the stuff that you send a newsletter, news, you can reuse that content multiple places. Even if you do a YouTube, do YouTube, post it in the news event, use it. I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we are in uh, early access, a survival for two years, started with uh, 1,500 wish lists, now with 1,200 1, sales and 4,000 wish lists. As I can see, I'm over 70% sales of survival genre. What I see during events like a Czechoslovakian uh, week, 
or open world event increased visibility brings sales. What do you think about those numbers, please? Um, I mean, I, I don't know your situation. This could be a side time project. I mean, you beat the median, which you did great. Like most games do not earn that type of money that you have. Um, um, I think that if you're sitting at 4,000 and you've been doing this for two years, I think you can, you, especially with your genre, you might be able to get more. Um, like I said, I think healthy, meaning you're doing good work, is like 10, earning 10,000 wish lists a year is kind of what I see as a healthy number. That means it's the right game and the right audience and you're doing the right types of promotion. Like I said, 1,000 per year. So I think you could do, be a bit more aggressive in your marketing. And like I said, the best ways to do that, especially since early access, I'd say your top ways to do it, streamer, edit, and festivals. Especially for your genre, those three are the best option you have to really grow your following and increase it. That's what I'd recommend. But the fact that you've released a game and you've got like four, uh, three to 4,000 sales, I think you said, pat yourself on the back. You did great. Good work. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is, are the demos helpful similarly to the alpha or beta versions maybe? What about Steam Next Fest event? Does it help? Okay, so there are two questions in there. Um, I think the beta and demo are two different things. Um, I think a demo is good to get an audience. Basically, the good thing about a demo is it's actually a piece of marketing that you can give to streamers so that streamers can play it and then show their following and their following will play your game. That's what demo is helpful. Beta is helpful. <clears throat> Running a beta is helpful because it um, it's like a timed exclusive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's an exclusive that gets people to jump. <clears throat> In marketing, you're always looking for excuses to say, act now, act now. A beta, if you run it for like a week, this week only <clears throat> is a beta. Excuse me, let me get some water and I'll still talk. <clears throat> um, with a beta, <clears throat> you are, um, a beta gets people excited about your game um, so that they act now and play it. Um, but I, I would make your beta different than your demo, like maybe add a little bit more content that's never been seen before for the beta so that, you know, your super fans who played your beta, follow you, they join your social media, join your mailing list, um, and then they play your beta, they've played your demo, and then you say, oh, we're doing a beta, and they play your beta, and they're like, this is the same thing as a demo. Then they feel bad. So make, always add some exclusive thing to the to the beta so that people are excited to try it out. Plus, you probably want to test new levels or something or new areas, so add new stuff to your beta. Um, I can't forget, forget, remember the last part. Uh, what was the, the what, second part of that about, question? What about Steam Next Fest event? Does it help? Oh, it really helps. Steam Next Fest is like another festival. You know, I said festivals are the best. And when I mean festivals, I mean like PAX Online, uh, The Mix. There's always, every week there's a new one coming out. Steam Next Fest is like the granddaddy of them all. And they do very well. Um, they have a lot of games in them, but if you do have a lot of wish lists and your game is really good, you can get better featuring on it and get a lot more wish lists. Now, my recommendation for Steam Next Fest is do the last, because you can do a Steam Next Fest, you can only do it once per year, I think. Um, you can, they do them every, th every four months is a new Steam Next Fest, okay? So I recommend timing your Next Fest to be the last one before you launch. And the reason I say it is don't do it early. Steam Next Fest is kind of curated. Steam, the Valve, people at Valve will look at all the games that come in and they'll put the better games like sometimes in a featured section or they'll include you in trailers. Um, so when you do the last one before you launch, your game's looking as good as it's gonna look. You're gonna have the most wish lists because the other thing is the more wish lists you have when you're in the festival, you get bumped up because sometimes there's like, notifications to everybody who's wishlist that your game's in the festival. So you get extra visibility, which puts you up higher. It all kind of compounds. So I recommend doing the last fest before you launch because you're going to have the most wishlist. Your graphics are going to be as good as they're possibly going to be. You're just ready to go with a bigger community. So that's my recommendation for next fest, but it's definitely good. Always do them, but don't do it right when you launch your game. Not when you first make your game. Do them the last one before you launch, okay? Okay, so uh, we have another <laughs> bunch of questions. Uh, okay, go for it. 
Yeah, yeah. You talked about games that have price. Are you there? Are there any additional things you would point out for free to play games on Steam? For free to play games? Yeah. Um, I to be totally honest, I don't know the free to play game market. Um. I don't. It's hard. <laughs> I I used it. I tried to make a free to play game, but I ended up just giving away my game because I didn't have the metrics right and all that stuff. So I'm sorry. I just can't give you uh, much free to play advice. Uh, okay. So then we will move on to another question. How does Steam page content affect the wishlist adoption? What are the best practices you would recommend? Okay. Best practices. You got to make your game look good. Graphics sell. If you're a programmer and you're doing programmer art. Hire an artist. Your game has to look so good and professional. Some of the best things I'd recommend, good capsule, pay an artist. Hire an artist to do the capsule. Even if you're making a pixel art game, hire an artist to make a really good looking capsule, okay? Then screenshots, make sure you have a variety of screenshots. If all your screenshots look the same, that tells players, oh, there must not be this much to the game. Remember how I said Steam players like deep content? If you have lots of varied screenshots with lots of environments, like a desert, a, a you know forest environment, an ocean environment, people are like, whoa, there's a lot of content in this game. You want to show that. The other thing that you want to do is have animated GIFs in the long about this game section um, that shows, again, what the gameplay is. And that's an important thing is you've got to show genre and gameplay. So genre and gameplay tell people like, what do I do in this game? And I know you've probably worked for years on this game. You know through your heart that this is a turn-based RPG game. But sometimes it's really hard to say it's a turn-based RPG. Players don't know that. You know it, but your players don't because they've seen this game for 10 seconds. So in 10 seconds, you have to be so clear to say, this is a turn-based RPG. You know, you have to just shout something that's so obvious to you. So good graphics, good clear genre, and um, having the right tags, super important. So that's my big recommendations. But again, how to make a steam page.com. I go through step-by-step step how to make a good page. I would recommend you specifically the question asker to go to how to make a steam page.com and get the stuff. I, I, I talk more detail than I'm doing now. All right. Next question. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, I've seen your videos. So that's why uh, we uh, have invited you. And I, I can tell that, uh, yeah, there are really good tutorials, how to, how to market the game on the steam. Yeah. That's, that's just, uh, by the way, okay. The yeah, just, no, no, I, I really no. appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so the next question. What about power of discounts? When, how deep at all? Okay, do discounts every time you can. Steam, they just, the shoppers on Steam only buy games on discount. They just do, you can try and fight it, but you're one person among everybody. Like, you gotta do discounts. That's just the way Steam works. The way to do discounts, you have to do them at least 20% discount, like 20% or greater of a discount because um, Steam only sends the email telling their people that your game is on discount if it's 20% or greater, okay? So that's number one. But don't go too deep too fast. You Players have, every player says, has mentally a limit they're willing to do for your game. They might buy your game when it's 30% off. Some might buy it at 40% off, some 50, some 75% off. So if you go, if your first discount is 75% off, you just gave away your game to everybody who would have bought it at 30, 40, 50, 60%. You just gave your game away for cheaper. So I call it stair-stepping. Basically every discount you do a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Um, and that just slowly picks off the people at their right price. Now, one thing that I like to do is at the, uh, there's a winter festival and a summer festival. Those are the big sales when everybody buys lots of games, they go crazy. I always recommend doing your deepest discount during those festivals. And that's just because people get a little, a little crazy. They just like, oh, I, I, I gotta buy some games. Oh, this game's like really cheap. I gotta buy it. I got, I know this game's never gonna be this cheap again. I gotta buy it this weekend. So I, that's why I recommend the summer and winter do your deepest discounts and otherwise just do kind of like stair step discounts down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the next question, what do you think is the easiest and the most effective way to promote my game and get good wish list numbers and traffic? Can you repeat that one more time? Okay, what do you think is the easiest and the most effective way to promote my game and get good wish list numbers and traffic? 
Okay. So like I said, festivals, look for festivals every day. Oh, you can go to my Discord um, on my website, how to make a, how to market a game.com. You scroll down, there's a Discord link right there on that front page. Click that. We have a special channel just telling you when the next festival is going to happen. You got to apply to every single festival you can because festivals bring in wish lists, they bring in extra visibility. The streamers watch them, so they'll stream your game. Number two, reach out to streamers, give your game to them. Say, please, I, I love your games. I love the games that you play. I think you're going to like my game play it. Three is Reddit. Reddit is tricky. It's really hard to sound without self-promotion. They ban you if you, you do it wrong, but it's worth it. Learn the voice of Reddit and post there. Those are your top three. Festivals, streamers, Reddit. That's what I'd focus on. Okay, so now they can <laughs> see your website, how to market the game on the TV. You you just cannot see it because we are live streaming in and putting everything together. But after after the uh, conference, you you will uh, get to uh, the recordings, so you will see. And okay, next question. Hi, Chris. First, big pleasure to see you here. Me and my fellow g game dev friends really like to watch your presentations. <laughs> And now maybe a bit tricky question. Do you believe in zero budget marketing? And do you have some specific recommendations for us small indie game devs? Maybe some good overall, overall strategy, how to build it up from nothing? I couldn't be here from the start, sorry, if I'm asking on something that was already answered. Oh, that's not a problem. Yeah, um, I do think, I mean, nothing's free. I mean, just like in life, the, the free things are always kind of like, eh, it's not that great. Um, except sunsets. Sunsets are beautiful and they're free. That I digress. Um, and waterfalls. Waterfalls are free too, and they're beautiful too. Anyway, a lot of things are free and beautiful. But anyway, I digress. Okay, so zero budget marketing. I, what am I doing? Okay, so zero dollar budget. Um, I I do recommend. I don't know if you're one of your folks is an artist. High quality capsule. That's what I'd spend money on. Spend money on a high quality capsule. I know you might be in a situation, look if the, talk to the artist that you might hire and say, listen, we don't make a lot of money. We don't have any money. I don't know if you don't make any money, but you're asking about free marketing, zero budget marketing. Um, I would still talk to the artist and say, hey, can you give us a design that's maybe a little cheaper? One thing I can recommend is just have them do just like a headshot of your character. And then you guys do the background. Like you just go on some free art website and find some cool background to put it on that might give you a cheaper price from the artist. Um, but you know, lawns, uh, do a bake sale, bake cookies, do chores for your parents. Um, you know, whatever you can to save up money for spending on your capsule, it's worth it to spend money on a capsule. Um, I, I don't know if that counts as zero dollars, but I would, I would spend money on that. Um, and then the rest of it is festivals are worth the dollars. Some of them are free. Some of them are, are paid. Do the free ones for now. Um, streamers are usually free. It's just time to like find and contact all those streamers. And then a uh, third is Reddit. That's free. So I think between pretty good. <coughs> if you know how to cook, like I said, bake sales, sell cookies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another question. Yeah, you you are, you are uh, getting to, uh, you are being so popular right now because there are tons of questions. <laughs> so okay, the next. Let me get one. another drink of water while you ask that no, question. No, no I... problem. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can ask another questions. <laughs> Go for it. Sorry, I just had to get a drink of water. Oh no problem. Okay, so are cura curators helping to spread the word around? Say say that one more time. Are curators helping to spread the word around? Um, if you're talking about that Steam feature called curation, I I don't I've never heard of anybody get a ton of visibility from curators. I just I don't think it really works or not. I've never really seen it work. It sounds cool. Like I don't know why it doesn't work. Um, but I just don't think it's a it's a thing that works. I don't know why. No, I don't see much from curators. No, I'm not that skilled in this section, but I think the curators are just reviewing the games and 
and I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so in your previous video you said gamers are looking for gameplay videos but not for a CGI trailer, I suppose. But they usually generate huge numbers on YouTube. Yeah, well, I mean, YouTube is different than... And I, I don't know which ones you're specifically talking about. Now, there's a couple things here. Okay, so on YouTube, it's a different story. When I talk about gameplay, I'm talking on the Steam page. So you might have a trailer that's all CGI or animation, and it does well on YouTube. What I'm talking about specifically is on your Steam page, because shoppers are just there like, what type of game is this? What type of game is this? They just want, they just want date details so they can make their change, okay? <clears throat> now, on YouTube... It's a different story, but I still think that gameplay is better than CGI because, oh, here's one thing. You might be looking at trailers now. I don't know what specific trailer you're looking at, but a lot of AAA games, you know, well-known games, they always do big trailers with lots of CGI. That's a, they're playing a different game than we are. Um, they've got huge brands, they've got all this stuff, so they can get away with the CGI trailer. Like, if you look at a trailer on, like, E3 for, like, Nintendo or Xbox, yeah, all those trailers are, like, CGI, but that's a totally different game. We're just, we're, like, working on zero budgets, making cookies for our, our art, um, we're doing our own things. That That's a different game than CGI trailers made by AAA companies. They're, they're playing a different thing. So if that's what you're looking at, adjust what you're looking at um, to look at at real trailers. One person I'd recommend is Derek <clears throat> Derek Loop. <clears throat> Excuse me. He uh, makes trailers. Uh, he he writes a, a newsletter about trailer making. Follow his advice on trailers. I'm not a trailer expert, but uh, he talks a lot about how to showcase gameplay in your trailer. Okay, another question. Uh, how expensive are streamers in general? I don't know. I I ha here's the thing is. Most of the success I've seen from streamers is free, not the paid. Um, I've worked for um, publishers that have paid for streamers, and the numbers were, like, not that great. Um, I Actually, if you're going to spend money, I think ads, uh, like Facebook and Reddit ads, are turning a better profit than spending on streamers. For streamers, I think it's better if you reach out to them um, over time and just at key points and say, here's a free copy of a game. Would you like to get targeting the right use money on trailers? Or I'm sorry, spending money on streamers. Okay, another question. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask also. What do you do when you launch a game and it's not successful? Is there a way to resurrect it? Um, I would try a few things. Um, I mean, it depends on how unsuccessful it is, but um, updates, Steam updates, like if it's, if the, if it just seems like nobody is playing it, try a couple updates, always discount your game, do a couple updates and use what's called a Steam visibility round. And if you go into Steam, just search Steamworks visibility round to find out more. Basically, when you do an update, you can publish what's called a visibility update where everybody who wishlisted it um, gets a extra visibility toward your game. Say, remember this game? It's on sale now. Um, but you can only use that if you've done a major update. So update your game a couple times. But if it's not working, if it's still like you do maybe two updates and still didn't see any impact increasing your sales, make two games. You're allowed to make two games. You're allowed to make three games. And you're going to learn so much more. And your next game is going to be better and better and better. Keep making games. Uh, pick the right genres. You're going to feel a lot better when you make a genre that people really, really want. So that's kind of my advice is try it. And if it doesn't, you can move on. It's it's not bad to have bad sales. It's hard to make games. So um, I've made bad games. I've made games that didn't sell. So just move on. <laughs> okay. I think the last question, maybe. Uh, should we always wait with the release of our game before we had good enough numbers in which list? Usually, us in these always have a smaller number than we should. Uh, than we should when the release date is approaching. Uh, I have feeling that moving the release for a few months later sounds like the better choice. Yeah, this okay. Here's what this depends on. This is how I'd make my decision. See what your look at the last few months. Look at your last six months of marketing. How many wishes do you get per month? 
and do the math. Are you gonna hit, I'd say 7,000 to 10,000 is what I would recommend people launch with. And then extrapolate, you can do, it's not that hard of math. If you can make a game, you can do the math to extrapolate this. So you just figure out like, okay, how long would it take us to get to 7,000 to 10,000 wish lists? Okay, um, assuming we get into a couple festivals or something, how long would that be? If it's like, oh, it's gonna take us another year to get 7,000, what that indicates is maybe your game just isn't hitting the market. You know, maybe the people just aren't interested in your game. That's, you know how I talked at the beginning, genre, 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 the most important marketing thing is your game. If your game is just people, if people, you do all this marketing and still nobody's like wish listing it and stuff, I would do this. Clean up your game, ship it. It's not gonna sell well, make a new one. Now that you know that what genres are hot, what types of things people like, um, make your next game and it'll be a lot better. So here's the, so basically my calculation is, do you think if you delay it a couple months, you're gonna hit that 7,000 to 10,000? If you're not, if even in your calculations, your estimates, you can't reach that, clean your game up, ship it out and make an awesome second game. Uh, okay. Uh, another question, it's for me. Uh, I think everybody is asking this question and that is that... They are, these are good questions. Yeah, <laughs> I see. Uh, uh, you know, there are tons of games coming every day on the Steam and my question is uh, when I should release my game to like don't get uh, to the bottom of the uh, like Steam release uh, chart or something like that. Yeah, um, here's my general thought. And this is just gut. Like, I don't know. I haven't done the numbers, but my gut. I think indies spend too much time to play the mental chess of like, okay, well, this game's coming up in this game. Oh, oh, this big game's coming. I think it's, I think they're, I think indies spend too long playing that game of like, oh, well, this game's the, uh, the same genre as me. Oh, it's coming out at the same time. I don't know. It's just really your game whenever. The only time I'd say not to is November, December. Again, because the big, big releases come out like, um, you know, like the big games come out in November, December. I think every other month is fine. I, I think indies spend too long trying to strategize the perfect release date. Again, the most important thing for your game is the type of game that you have. All that other stuff, doesn't it doesn't matter as much. So just don't release in November and December and you'll be fine. Some people say that January is a nice month to release because the press and streamers don't have anything to talk about because no games come out in January. So maybe if you launch a game in January, that's awesome. But anything than that, don't stress about it. There's other things to stress about other than the specific day that you launch. Don't don't worry about that. Okay, uh, someone is typing another question. Uh, m maybe I will ask you now, uh, do you have, for example, uh, uh, some time to like uh, chat with somebody who is like interested in uh, getting to know more, like for a few minutes after uh, the speech? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple services email me. My email address is right there on the thing. Um, there's a couple services I offer. So if you want a roadmap, if you're like, I don't have any idea that my game's good, I just don't know how to market it. I do this thing called the, the marketing roadmap where you and I sit down and we plot out what you're doing, what I would recommend, that's $1,000 to do that. A cheaper version, if you just want to ask me whatever you want, very detailed, show me numbers. I do an hour session, you, we just cut a call just one-on-one, -on -one, even though I know it's one to a thousand, there's a thousand people watching, right? And it's just one to one, and I just we just talk about whatever you want. I can look at your numbers, whatever it is. It's a hundred dollars for an hour of your time, and it's just a face to face meeting like this. Um, so th you can find both of those. Just email me, and I'll I'll show you where those are. There's my email address right there. Say I'm interested, and I'll send you the links to those coaching um, portals. Okay, someone is still typing, so I will I will ask you uh, another question. Uh, have you seen our indie expo section or, or go through the games that are exhibited right now? No, I haven't. But after this call, I will go take a look. Okay, so then uh, it it will be uh, a good if you like um, that after after this uh, um, event uh, send me. Uh, uh, three games that you think are the, like the 
most interesting to you uh, because we are like uh, doing um, uh, awards after after we finish this event and we like uh, are voting about the best game maybe if if you have time you can go and like give you give some tips that like this game has a good team page or something if if you have time of course yeah i'll i'll do it so if i pick a, those are they going to win a prize uh <laughs> no not you but people can also vote but uh your your word is also uh, also uh okay <laughs> i will important. definitely pick out the top 3 that i think okay um, chris's picks chris's hot picks <laughs> okay so so if if you don't see them they are in the in this stage there are like a tons of voice uh, and text channels and you can you can go and take a look there they also have uh, steam pages and links so you can you can uh, take a look okay we have another question what do you personally like to see to change on current the current game project what do you personally don't like about what we are doing okay wait I, I, I don't know if i understood that question oh, oh i don't know either <laughs> okay if you just rewrite it uh, i'll see if i can answer it yeah okay okay may, may, maybe after we will finish the speech and maybe you can uh, answer the uh, the remaining questions for example okay so in uh, thank you thank you chris a lot for for your awesome speech uh we are really glad you have joined us today and uh, yeah wish you luck in your career and thank you very much for joining us today thank thank you for inviting me thank you so much i appreciate it yeah so uh uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, my sa teraz uh, presunieme po reklame ešte na jedno záverečné slovo a potom sa spolu rozlučíme. Uh, ešte nás čaká jedno predstavenie, takže uh, ešte ostanete s nami chvíľku. Majte sa. Náš stream sa teda uh, priblížil ku koncu a my vám teda chceme všetkým poďakovať, že ste sa zúčastnili na Games Crunch Connect 2021. Ďakujeme aj našim partnerom, uh, Prilomek Partners, Mavericks, uh, DJ Campus za toto skvelé ozvučenie, uh, partnerovi uh, Vision Game, uh, ďalej partnerom Warhol Studios, uh, Ashborn Games a Bohemia Interactive. 
A teraz nasleduje ešte posledná časť programu, ktorá už bude mimo live streamu a teda môžete sa prísť pozrieť na český workshop právnický, ktorý bude viesť Jaroslav Menšík, s ktorým ste sa už stretli minulú akciu. A workshop bude pokračovať voľným štýlom a teda Jaroslav ho ukončí, keď, keď budú zodpovedané všetky vaše otázky a teda keď sa rozhodnete, že že workshop je skončený. My vám teda ešte raz ďakujeme všetkým a dúfame, že sa uvidíme na budúce a že ste si tú akciu rovnako užili ako my prípravu. Majte sa.